know what's funny? The Steelers had the number 15 overall pick in the upcoming draft, and they invested it in a quarterback. This town would be going nuts. I mean, completely nuts. The funny part? They've got one of those already. Good morning to you. Good Thursday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is is Daily Shot of Steelers. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into hockey and or baseball. I also offer Daily Shots of Penguins and Pirates, the other two teams in town that I cover. Dwayne Haskins, number 15 overall pick just a couple of years ago. Yes, it was Washington. And yes, Dan Snyder was a little too influential in the process. And yes, Haskins pretty much flopped as a rookie, and Ron Rivera benched him, and then everything else happened. But the fact remains, he was a number 15 overall pick, and nobody takes that away from you. Nobody can take it away from you. Once they call your name, once you come out onto that stage and you give Roger Goodell the big hug, it's done. You are that pick until the end of time. And yet, similar in some ways to the discussion that we were having on this show earlier this week about Mason Rudolph, it seems like Pittsburghers, while they, they're they okay with Haskins as an option, as a potential surprise, come and show us something, it's just as easy to sense that there's not really any excitement about him. There's a difference. There's a difference between being open to being surprised by someone and being outright excited. Why might this be? Well, you know, there's going to be people who paid close enough attention to the entire league to remember exactly how he performed in his brief time as a starter in Washington. And they're going to say, well, that's that. But if you want me to tell the truth, I'd suspect it had more to do with the fact that when Haskins had a chance to separate himself from Rudolph in that final preseason game this past summer, he didn't. He didn't. And so that was that. He went to number three on the depth chart. He wasn't even as visible to people as Josh Dobbs was, injured and everything else, and pretty much off the depth chart because Ben loves having Dobbs around during games, and it's like Haskins just stopped existing. And, you know, not all that many people protested. I I didn't get a whole lot of, put Haskins in there. Why? I'm going to have to assume it was one crappy preseason game, you know, (laughs) because there really hasn't been a whole lot of other evidence, at least not that the public sees, because the public doesn't see practices. So here's what I want to do. I want to do my tiny insignificant part here. Just like earlier this week, I set up an episode inviting your feedback on Rudolph. And just like you responded with close to a thousand comments on our various platforms, I'm sending out another invite. Come at me with anything you've got on Haskins, whether it's his time in Washington, whether it's stuff that you've seen from preseason here, or those of you who made it down to Heinz Field for the open training camp sessions, even personally, even from a leadership standpoint. You know, heaven knows we got into a bunch of that as it related to Rudolph. We're going to play this even right across the board. I shouldn't say we. I'm going to do that. Okay, I'm going to promise to you that now and going through OTAs and minicamp and training camp, preseason, even right into the regular season, I'm going to be open-minded. I will acknowledge to you having a little bit of a Rudolph bias here. I think more of him uh, than most people do. But I also like quite a bit of what I saw of Haskins last summer. 
This portion of Daily Shot of Steelers is brought to you by Point Park University. Choose from nearly 100 career-focused programs leading to bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. Choose when and how you'd prefer to do that studying, whether it's at Point Park's gorgeous downtown Pittsburgh campus, whether it's online, maybe a flexible hybrid format would work best for you. Find out more about all of this at pointpark.edu. It was after one of those preseason games that Ben made the remark about Haskins being able to throw a ball through a car wash without getting it wet. And it was a perfect, perfect description. Because when Haskins was at his best, that's what he was doing. He found targets in tight spaces. And because of his arm strength, he was able to crush those targets. He threw the ball with velocity. And he did it sometimes on the run, you know, rolling out to his right. And it was fun. Fun to watch. Fun to anticipate what Haskins was about to do next. Not that he was out there winging it too much. He was trying to show the coaches, if anything. And he talked about this, that he could play a structured game within the Matt Canada offense. This was back before that became a running joke. And make things happen with the receivers that he had, with the various options that they'd have running those guys and arounds and all that other stuff, while also focusing the offense on Najee Harris. He wanted to demonstrate to the coaches that he could be that guy. And for a good portion of that camp, he did. He really did. I'm not a believer in fixating on the last bad thing I saw, I'd like to look over his whole body of work and say, hey, that's someone who absolutely deserves a chance to be the Steelers' number one quarterback. And by every account, including the words that came from Mike Tomlin's mouth shortly after the season, he'll have it. Tomlin acknowledged, somewhat starkly, that Neither Rudolph nor Haskins has handled true everyday duties to the extent that they've earned everyday status. That's not a put down. That's a fact. That's a fact. Let's remember that for all the challenges that Mason had in 2019 and being thrust into a starting role, there was a point in the season where the head coach chose Duck Hodges over Rudolph. And in Haskins' case, obviously, things unfolded the way they did in Washington. But enough from me. Again, we're going to play this even. We dedicated basically two episodes this week to Rudolph. We're going to do two to Haskins. This one that I just did here, and then the one tomorrow where I'll be reading your voluminous and passionate Comments. And by the way, if you come in with a lower number of comments, I'm going to presume that you're just, you're like 100% in on Rudolph. So make sure that you get your feedback in, regardless of how you feel. When we come back, just one question. Today's comes from my glasses. Girl. I can't see a thing without my glasses. Give me a second. Today's comes from Rodney Shushman, who asks, What's your take on the tanking issue? I contend there's no way any coach in the NFL could ever convince his players to go along with tanking, even if they get paid a bonus for each loss. There's professionalism involved, there's pride. And yes, Rodney, you are completely correct. In fact, in the sordid history of tanking throughout sports, whether it's the NFL or anything else, you're not going to find players who were involved. I mean, you can really dig and go back to the 1919 so-called Black Sox scandal whenever the White Sox had 
couple of players who were paid to do their part to throw the World Series. But what you won't find, at least not to my knowledge, and if I'm wrong, someone feel free to step up and correct me, you're not going to find players involved in even the most glaring cases of tanking. Unfortunately, the term is now so common, mostly because of the practice in Major League Baseball, where teams that operate at an economic disadvantage, you know, kind of like the local one, will strip payroll down for the purpose primarily of finishing in a lousy enough spot in the standing so that they can draft really high and get some tremendous young talent and start a cycle. Ah, enough of that. <laughs> Let's just say the Pirates are no strangers to the concept. But there's a difference between the Black Sox scandal and the kind of tanking that came up in Brian Flores' lawsuit related to the Miami Dolphins because the Dolphins weren't going around the locker room, not even by Flores' account, and handing guys cash to lose games. It doesn't happen at the player level. So the way you phrased your question was exactly correct. There's professionalism, there's pride, and it just you're running too big a risk. Think of it more from the perspective of the fewer people that know about it, the less chance it has to go awry. This isn't something that even the executives involved are going to casually stroll around to their team headquarters and talk about. It's going to be something that's between two or three people with an understanding. But that's where the Flores case really goes into newer territory. Remember that his lawsuit is being contested by the Dolphins, so none of this has been worked out in a court of law or anything like that. So presuming innocence, guilt, whatever else, all my other uh, disclaimers out of the way, if, in fact, the Dolphins were paying Flores a ton of money to lose games, A, that's insanely wrong, and B, well, he can do it. Oh, the, the head coach of a National Football League team probably has more control, singular control, of a game's outcome than in any other North American sport. Think about it. It's the most scripted of all of the North American sports. All he has to do is come up with a terrible game plan. and His team's not going to survive it. If his coordinators aren't in on the gig, and again, I'd be surprised if they were, he can just overrule the coordinators. It's not like there isn't precedent for that, including right here in Pittsburgh. He could probably throw that game to a degree of 30, 40 points. But yeah, it stinks. I don't mean to make light of it. I was certainly relieved to find out that Huey Jackson spoke out of turn, actually somewhat recklessly in hindsight, when he accused the Browns' ownership of behaving in a similar way and then took it back like the next day. But this sort of thing can't be tolerated in sports. You can't start having people questioning the integrity of the game. And the NFL, I know they've taken it easy on, oh, you know, certain coach in New England over the years who's done some pretty rotten things to help win games. But there's no blind eye to be had here. The NFL is knee-deep in its relationship with the gambling world and just beyond that. I mean, as long as I brought up the 1919 Black Sox, the last thing you need is people wondering whether or not something that they're watching is legit. You don't want to start thinking about shoeless Joe Jackson, you know. This is going to be a case, I believe, that 
Roger Goodell will take far, far more seriously than anything that the cheaters in Foxborough got away with. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Steelers. We will do another one tomorrow, but remember, you, you've got to step up here. You can't let Dwayne Haskins down because I'm going to be counting the number of responses between the two quarterbacks. <laughs>